Dylan, hello, Welcome, Dylan. Dylan. Hello, Dylan. You are yeah. a new face to me. So, uh, welcome. Uh, nice to have How you, you going, along. Robert? Yeah. Where, where are you coming in from, Dylan? I, yeah, I keep, I've tr yeah, I'm Brisbane, Australia. Um, right. I've tried, I, I don't know, probably about four or five times to get into the Eastern Town Hall, and every time uh, my link says it's an hour ago. So, I always I wait about half an hour and then just give up but uh this time i started contacting a few more people and even felix got back to me and said it's in an hour so i'm not sure how the calendar keeps telling me an hour later yeah it's I, the uh, meet up it's the meetup event i tried to edit it but i can't edit it because it shows one, yeah, okay. hour, one hour earlier okay all right yeah uh the, um i i have a similar sort of issue with the uh town hall the main town hall, some other sort of one, um, it shows up at the wrong time always. Uh, my my only issue with that is it uh, yeah three in the morning. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's what I was about to say. It's at five o'clock in the morning, so it's actually not too much of a problem at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I think I joined one of Felix's uh, meetings the other night, uh, and it was yeah four well four in the morning. Uh, I just woke up really early, so I jumped in. I jump in when I can. Uh, lately, I've been doing that. I don't know why I keep waking up at four in the morning, but meetings are on, so I jump in. Uh, good to meet new people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I'll, I guess I'll explain a little bit about myself, how I fit in. Um, I've been into Cardano since 2017, uh, looking at a lot of things, but I am a chemical engineer and I've got a degree in information systems and I'm an algae farm manager and we have delivered algae farms globally. Uh, we design, uh, run, and operate and uh, also do uh, a lot of research in the field. And we're looking at onboarding uh, algae farms onto the blockchain. So we've got a project called Algae Token. Uh, so dealing a lot with uh, Cardano for climate and other climate associations because it is the most sustainable um, sort of venture on the planet um, with just the mere fact that algae provides more oxygen to the planet than trees do. Uh, so we're looking at focusing on food for nutrition and protein, uh, but there's also feed stock fuel and a whole plethora of advantages to this. So uh, that's sort of my focus, getting climate and health, nutrition all a bit better. And then also bringing Cardano closer to like a net zero or even better if we can. That's pretty awesome. Those are sort of topics I care greatly about. No, not so much the algae, but uh, pretty much everything else. It's not that I don't care about al algae. I do. I care about the sort of sort of things like that, but I just don't know much about algae. Um, how does that? Uh, um, how, how does it yeah, fit with things that's like that's the biggest uh, thing? Yeah. How does it fit with sort of like uh, seaweed and uh, related? Uh, yep. Okay, so, well, seaweed is a macroalgae yeah. and we deal with microalgae. So same sort of genomes, but different species. Uh, seaweed is a lot larger. We're talking, yeah, like a uh, nano size. Um, so very tiny. Um, our, our production is uh, all sustainable. All the water we use is recyclable. We don't use arable water, so we, we can use ocean water. We don't need arable land, so we're not competing at all with agriculture, uh, but we can benefit agriculture with this. Uh, so all your Amiga oils and everything like that, that people are realizing they need in their diet, they all come from the algae, the fish eat the algae, and that's where it's from. So we can grow the algae, extract all of the nutritional oils, and then what's left over is a super high value vegan protein that's um, very high quality and it and this is the fastest growing plant on the planet. Uh, so very sustainable. Uh, we, we, the, the biggest thing at the moment uh, for us is the education part, because as you said, not many people know of these benefits. So focus is currently uh, not only sort of onboarding this onto uh, blockchain, but also education. We need to inform people of these benefits and that, make them aware that this is a solution. I mean, this is the only um, plant um, 
that is capable of replacing fuel. Uh, how I got into all this was um, looking for a, a climate initiative program that I could help to sort of benefit the environment and reduce climate and then started looking into fuel, being a chemical engineer that was enticing and into biofuels to what could replace it. So looking into food crops for biofuel, uh, doing a lot of research into that, you quickly learn that we have a bigger problem than fuel, we're running out of food. So then trying to find uh, a, a feedstock and um, the solution that I found is algae, it does all three. So uh, that's been a focus for many, years and the groups had 15 years experience of setting up these farms so we're very experienced with that we know how to do that um but yeah bringing a project like this onto the blockchain and taking sort of advantage of the blockchain using supply chain tracking uh quality management and the ability to sort of use the tokenomics for participants around the world is uh what we're focusing on but we really just need to uh educate people on this so they're aware um okay so so let's take this until that you've been building these things for um for 15 years you've been rolling this sort of thing out so um let's park say the supply chain side of things to one side here and just say what what's the benefit of doing a blockchain why, why use a blockchain for you guys? Yep. Why do we need it? Okay, there's lots of benefits with, uh, I guess if we're, the supply chain's good for like uh, the traceability to make sure it's, it's a high quality product and there hasn't been sort of uh, any interference with radiation or anything with, with, the, with the products. Uh, but apart from that, uh, doing it on blockchain just opens up um, a whole variety of people to be able to get involved. Turning this into a DAO opens the opportunity for everyone to be involved and then for um, everyday people to have a say. Eventually, because we're looking at doing the farms as social impact or um, B Corp or uh, non-profit, depending on the jurisdiction we can go in. And for that, then we've got the opportunity of feeding people that need food uh, and continuing um, you know, any of the benefits that we can that doing this uh, commercially sort of is more of a, are profit focused while if if you've got the the profits there and it's enough then you can also have a percentage of that looking at more social impact improvements so that's that's one of the benefits um i mean i do i am in a fairly uh good position to do this commercially uh and that's we we are consultants that do set up these but this is an opportunity here for everyone to be part of it in a decentralized way rather than uh, just small company, well, not small, large companies operating this. There's, the plan is to go globally and then be able to have algae farms all around the world. And that's obviously dependent on the type of species we grow for locations because they are plants. It's like any plant, you can't grow certain species everywhere but there are advantages everywhere. We're looking at setting up first in Australia because we know this climate, we know the species that grow here, we know the products, we've done all the economic evaluations. And then from there, looking at uh, UAE, Africa and Europe. So there's, um, we've got experience um, in USA, Vietnam, um, India, um, Australia and many more countries. So. We've been able to do this globally. Uh, the 15 years ago, all of the focus was on fuel and we've proven that we can do that. It's just not yet economically viable. Uh, it's getting closer as fuel prices go out and as fuel supplies diminish. So it's definitely something that will be, but um, looking deeper into it and as more research go, we've discovered that humans are really missing out on a lot of their necessary nutrients. And we need to make people aware of this for improved health. Uh, this will, will help you live better for longer. Um, I can't say at all, you know, it will increase your life. I mean, it may well do, but at least in those later years, you will be healthier. So that's one thing that we're trying to do. 
Cool. Um, Felix, you had your hand up before. I don't know whether you still wanted to put a question in or not. No? OK. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've been you know, aware of things like the, the growth rates and stuff of seaweed and, uh, you know, as I say. Uh, what I'm interested in here is two things. Uh, the setup cost, you know, what, what's actually required to set up a algae farm. Uh, because yep. this obviously impacts the uh, ability for financing options and stuff, what you need and who can do it and, and a, a social enterprise type environment. Um, and also what yep. is the um, post pro, you, you grow this thing and then what has to be done afterwards to get it to market, whatever that market. Yep. Okay. Well, the first one is the most difficult part of any of these um startups with with doing this project uh whether uh for commercially or the same we're we're looking at a 10 million dollar startup so that's a a size of a farm where we know it's economically viable and sustainable and then from there growing from that so our our model looks like starting the farm and then two years time we should be able to profit that much again from it. So there'll be initial startup time where we need to build and everything, but once the products are being built, we'll be able to uh, almost um, recuperate that $10 million a year from our product. And then what we're looking at doing is expanding the, if we can get it to be a non-for-profit, then the revenue created, half of that will go to expanding the farms and the other half will go to buying back the tokens to put up with pressure on the tokens and raise the price of the token. So it's a, a bit of a different idea there for the, for the tokenomics and how that works with a, with a product on there. Uh, so um, we've just um, signed with Genius X Launchpad. So they're assisting us with all of these, um, uh, you know, interactions with with how to do this. Uh, we've also got some very good um, lawyers and people like that that we're dealing with and trying to work out what, what is the most sustainable way of doing this. So it's a, a project that can last for at least 15 years. That's, that's our game goal. And then by 15 years time, uh, it should be a fully fledged DAO and be operated by the whole community and continue on. Uh, so there are challenges because it's it's not something we can follow someone else that's done a similar thing. Uh, so we're having to sort of trailblaze our way through this and decide the best way of doing it. Uh, and that has its challenges because the regulations and uh, legislations globally are all in place yet for things like this. So we're having to work with what we can and try to get it so it's in a state that won't won't fall over and is as i said sustainable sort of project structure um for this and what's the um yeah you know, this 10 million a year after two years and where's oh the the, the supply the, yeah you know, okay. the demand demand oh, yeah, side okay. of things we we have more demand for product than we can possibly supply it. When we talk to people that are looking to, to buy it, um, we cannot meet their demands. And uh, it's, it's got a ginormous growth. Uh, a lot of companies are working out what, what the benefits are here for this. So, uh, you know, we have like hundreds of messages a month of people requesting to purchase it. So, so we've got all of our contacts for that. And then in the commercial ones we set up, we set up. So there's, you know, agreements with offtake prior to them even setting up. So they have that. It's ensured that there is a, a supply and, and demand met for that. So all, all of the physical aspects inside of it, the algae farming, uh, the setup, the economics, the design, uh, methodologies, uh, procedures and uh, yeah, the final clients uh, are all taken care of. We do that normally with our consultancy, but um, yeah, bringing it onto the blockchain, we don't do daily. So that's that's where we're all 
looking at this and um, the team's two PhD microbiologists, chemical engineers, I'm a chemical engineer as well. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, we've, we're fairly, you know, knowledgeable uh, group and we believe in peer reviewed, you know, journal articles when we do our science. And that's one thing that drew, drew us to Cardano and it's low sort of uh, environmental impacts too. So uh, these are all things that we're interested in. And we, we felt that our values align with Cardano in that. So uh, that's the one we're leading forward to. Um, we will be, we've had discussions with a couple of other um, interested cryptocurrencies. Um, so we are sort of evaluating everything. Um, so we just, yeah, we're, we're, we're all still liking Cardano and want to go forward with it, but um, it's hard if others are dangling big carrots in front of you cash-wise to, to start this up. Uh, but we will be doing whatever is environmentally the best because that's, that's the whole nature of this. We want to do good. We want to do some social things. If we all wanted to be rich, we'd be just looking at just doing it commercially. Right. In terms of, there's obviously uh, a couple of other questions I've got for you. Um, one is just what um, relationship is there likely to be with algae farming with respect to like carbon credits and the UN Sustainability Development Goals? So that's the first question. And if, so if you answer that, then I'll want to talk more about supply yep. chain. Yep. So the um, um, well, with the with the seventeen um, SNGs, like the the uh, worldwide organisation has said, where nearly all of them. Um, I mean, things like education is a bit iffy, but I mean, working in in uh, you know universities and dealing with that and looking at. education is what was the most required thing currently. We sort of slightly fit into that, but I'd say that would be one of our least. Um, we'd like to, obviously, uh, the challenges such as, you know, um, equality, things like that, we need to maintain. I mean, that's not the focus of this project, but it's something we need to focus on as a, as a you know, a entity. But um, pretty much all of the others are all big ticks from us. Um, I mean, algae can clean water, it can, it can just do everything. I mean, the food, food supply, fuel, energy, it's just, it's just everything. Um, and that's why I've, I've fallen in love with it. It is the most sustainable thing I've ever seen. And um, the science proves that. And now that the technology is um, caught up to it. Um, sorry, what was the other one apart from the SDGs? Oh, oh, uh, carbon, um, carbon um, credits. Carbon, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, we've looked we um, looked in, in other lines of work. We've looked at carbon sequestration in, in our forestry and th things like that. And a couple of us worked on that. And that's another big one with um, algae because uh, it, does, it does reduce CO2. We're looking um, with CSIRO in Australia and other companies around the world. They've got technologies they're working on which actively uh, absorb CO2 from the atmosphere into a membrane and then sort of heat that membrane up, get it out, and they ha then have the CO2 from the atmosphere. And we can feed that to the algae and, and turn it into oxygen. So for every two kilos of CO2 we put in, we can get a kilo of oxygen. And we have methodologies of putting it in only where it, when it needs it. It's not like it's just being pumped in and then coming out to the atmosphere. We only feed what it needs. So uh, it's not wasteful in that manner either. And when, you know, like nutrition, same with nutrition and things like that. When we feed nutrients to the algae, it's all absorbed. There's no sort of runoff or anything like that as you get with farming. So we're not causing those issues as well. Uh, so we're, we're looking strongly at um, obviously um, what we can do more with carbon credits because it, it is a huge thing. And this is obviously a... Um, 
extremely sort of environmentally friendly, but uses those that carbon up. So that's one of the aspects we'll be looking at too, and we're looking into um, either implementing that ourselves or teaming up with other people doing it. So um, there can be, you know, that carbon credits used. So both of those are, yeah, positive at this stage. Hmm. Very positive. Okay. Um, so in terms of um, the manufacturing, the growing process and stuff, to what extent does um, it require um, technology to drive the whole process, the actual growing process? Okay, well, yeah. Yeah, okay. So there's the growing itself is just um, what methodology you, you use. So there's several different types of um, methods of doing this. So we've found uh, our method is the most viable for volume um, and, and for cost. So the economics in ours all stands out. Uh, the, the technology itself in um, sort of uh, the cultivation and growing, it isn't, oh, well, in, in the cultivation, and there is definitely technology involved, but the, the growing is just more understanding the microbiology of it and having sort of quality assurance there, making sure that your standards are up to uh, date and that you're taking very good care and there's no cross contamination. It's like growing any crop. You need to do it correctly. You need to know what you're doing. Um, you know, if you've got a sugar cane farmer to suddenly just start growing potatoes, they're not going to know what to do properly. Um, there's going to be a bit of a transition there. Uh, but you've got to make sure it's like any any um, agricultural. If you've got, uh, you know, weeds will try to grow, you've got to make sure you maintain that safely. Uh, everything we do is in a, in a safe stand and we, uh, you know, are up to has up sort of standards and all the other standards that are required uh, for food grade. So um, that's all taken care for. The technology involved is... Um, sort of downstream processing and how, how you do that the best way. And that's sort of where our, um, you know, knowledge and uh, comes into it of what we do and how, how we do this and how we operate it correctly. So... Um, what I'm interested yeah, in I, here is of, um, where the crossover, if we look at things like um, uh, both... Uh, carbon credits and stuff, particularly the volunteer carbon credits, rely on, um, yeah, they want evidence, they want veracity associated with um, where the credits have come from and the more information you can provide. Um, and obviously, also, if we're looking at supply chain uh, traceability, uh, we're trying to look at things, how can we build veracity into the supply chain of information effectively the value chain that comes along with the, uh, the information that's produced so technology plays quite a big role in all of that across the ag agricultural sector uh, so i'm interested in what your thoughts are in terms of like uh, processing all of that but before you answer that angela's got her hand up so i'll just uh let her chime on it did i see, did i hear you say veracity or voracity veracity the, okay. the, the veracity <laughs> of information, yes. Yeah. Uh, can you um, verify that it's true, basically? Um, so I'm um, interested to know what your thoughts are in terms of when we talk about supply chains, when we talk about carbon credits, and to a, uh, a, a big extent also when we talk about the sustainability development goals, the UN ones, they're all talking about information yep. flows. And so what's your thoughts around uh, how your production process, your cultivation process and your production process fit within that? And where can that benefit from a blockchain sort of being put into the mix? Well, well that's exactly um, sort of one of the points of this uh, because we, we collect all our data um, for quality assurance and everything that, but that also, that data ends up being the data for, you know, how much, um, you know, how much carbon basically we were growing, how much algae have we grown from that and how much CO2. So all of those, uh, all those numbers can be quantified um, scientifically. 
through that. And if it's all on a, a ledger, whether it be API at this stage or however we can manage it, depending on you know the growth of uh, the blockchain and the ability for metadata to be stored there, then that's all uh, either accessible from you know metadata linked to somewhere else or anything. But those, if you get those decentralized sort of ledgers, then you, it's got that traceability and um, then you know, sort of the proof line of the carbon credits for that. So that's, yeah, one of the benefits to trace it all. Okay. And so um, this would be an objective that you'd be looking to try and achieve is integrate your existing production processes, your, your cultivation processes, and with the blockchain would be looking to do this sort of work as well as doing the organisational, as well as doing the financial. Is that the sort of general picture, these these three main areas? Yes. Um, and it's working out the best way to do that uh, in the correct legal and jurisdictional frameworks that we have uh, with all the regulatories. So um, that's what we have to work out, how to, how to do this uh, the best way as well. So that's that's where the, the lawyer's skills and the accountants come into it. Uh, and then uh, the legal entities globally, because because we do want to do this globally, it's going to be slightly different everywhere in the world. Uh, but the farms themselves, we want them to be, if we can, you know, if you'd say like uh, non for profit entities uh, that have, you know, um, got agreements with with the um, token, and then they are uh, funding back. The, the the rewards to the token. Yeah, so I'd, that I'll maintains dig, growth yeah, of that. Dig into the token economics, the ideas and the mechanisms that you've got in, in a moment. But I was just wondering, anyone else sort of got questions that they want to ask or uh, talk about with respect to um, what Dylan's been going on about, whether it be in algae or whether in it's any sort of other agricultural sector? Anthony, welcome. Joe, welcome. Joe, I know quite well. Um, but uh, Anthony, it's lovely to see you here. Uh, Angela, go ahead. Uh, have you put it down on idea scale? Can we have a link? How far are you writing okay. them? We, we had two proposals last fund day, um, came in pretty late, and then the whole team pretty much got COVID. But uh, so it made us, we weren't able to go into uh, the idea fest and things like that because of that. Uh, we were very close in now. We wanted to make a macro micro algae hub. So that's for seaweed and algae to get all the people working on that because we found a, a, a number of them and then educate people through that. So we were literally like the money ran out and then us sort of thing. Um, and we were asking for 15,000 there for education. And if we'd asked for 11, we would have got it, but that's, that's the way this works. Um, this time where we're looking um, and we're all working on what are the best proposals that would fit this. Uh, so we haven't actually put any up yet, but I'd expect to see something um, sometime this week for that. Uh, and yet again, we've, we've got, um, yeah, the, there's a few things like possibly in the Dow arena, um, the, the product integration, uh, the uh, and then a couple of like sort of slightly social aimed ones, but we do have other benefits that aren't just aren't just social. We've, we're trying to integrate all of the aspects of this into it, rather than just saying, "Hey, this is a great social or environmental um, thing." There's actually the other aspects that we're trying to to bring forward. Um, and yeah, does that answer everything? I quite easily get, I just, my mind goes and I start to talk about other other things that I, I feel are important at the time, but I'm like probably not even related at all to the to the question. So yeah. I'm sorry if I do that. Uh, Joe, got your hand up. Kia ora. Hi, Dylan. How are you? Dil I know How you going, Joe? From, uh, I'm good. Pacific. Um, I know Dylan from the Pacific Town Hall, right? <laughs> yep. 
every time we we see Dylan at one o'clock in the afternoon is New Zealand time. Um, he's actually working and playing with algae while he's on the screen. It's frigging awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just, it's funny. I, 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 yeah, you've said I've distracted you a couple of times. I'll be doing uh, yeah, analytical work, and uh, I've like got test tubes and mixing stuff. But I'm like eagerly <laughs> listening, and I forget that people can see me. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> it, that's uh, that's yeah, that's a um, sort of convenient time during the day, uh, rather than yeah. But yeah, it's yeah. it's good. What's your what's your question, Joe? So my question is um, about how easy it is to set up an algae farm. Like, what are the are there any regulatory uh, requirements for setting up an algae farm? Like, where does it fall? For instance, in New Zealand, is this Ministry of Ag? You know, is this Department yep. of Conservation? Are there um, issues with you know species types you know do you have to get licenses what's the yep. yeah what's the the, the hoops you need all, to of, jump all to? of the above yeah so <laughs> um you must have <laughs> yeah licenses for the species you must go through like you know epa um you must go through all the the regulations and then there's the other regulations of like what do you want to do with the product in and what's it for is it a food then you need hazard you know gmp things like that so there are all the mm -hmm. Um, normal industrial standards for like we like to look at it as a, as a food so we need to to abide by all of those standards uh, so you, you do need that sort of knowledge um, I, I guess it would depend on where you are I know like even in Australia there's different rules in Queensland to New South Wales so it's a whole you know globally there's going to be different sort of cases everywhere um, the overall idea of algae farming and you know like i could sh sh show i think i probably have shown you around a bit of the farm there i don't think i've run through that whole step-by-step -step case through one of the in the, one of the pacifics but um like at, at the pilot plant we can show you the steps taken but and and a lot of it seems very easy but then it comes down to those uh, those little specifics of the sciences and the understanding the microbiology and understanding you know that the engineering of doing it and it and I guess it's dependent on how large scale you want to go. The most popular algae in the world is spirulina, which most people have heard of now. And that is the reason it's the most popular is because it is really, really, really easy to grow and really, really easy to harvest. Um, mm. And so that's a lot of people doing that because it's not hard. We're looking at species that are a lot harder but they have many more sort of benefits. Spirulina is a great product, don't get me wrong, um, but uh, it depends on what the final outcome. I mean, there's, you know, 100,000 different types of algae in the world and they all have different benefits, whether they're different lipids or they're different sort of nutrient contents in there. So if you're looking for food or fuel or, or what you're looking at, and, and there's, it's sort of like an untapped, um, resource where now the science is getting into it and they're realizing, hey, we can do, I've, I've seen people, they're using it for um, regrowing people's bones using algae, which is like something I would never have thought of. Um, you know, we've got algae that you feed to cattle and they reduce their methane outputs. Um, or we've got ones that specialize in beta carotene. So uh, they, you, you, don't, you know, you can get it for there instead of carrots. We've got, um, you know, you ask the xanthan, that's the pink, that they put into salmon. Uh, we've got all, all these great, great products and great availabilities. And so there's plenty of options there and um, it's just understanding how to do it. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's a lot more interest now globally. So we have people contact us all the time wanting to do it. And, and, it, and it sometimes it does come down to our, our um, what they want and, you know, our time time frame like what, how much we can offer can, like concerning what we wanted to do so yeah um you know trying to concentrate this on a more of a social um open DAO, like where everyone can get involved um and that would have to be obviously um scientifically operated in uh, initially because um you you know you want people to be able to vote for certain things but you don't want people that don't have technical skills voting on 
technical things. Um, so there's there's all that. I mean, the whole the whole DAO world is a is a a new and interesting um, experiment, if you will. That there's no sort of set ways to do things. So uh, people are going to find different ways of using that best for governance. Um, and then you know, there's also risks involved in that as well, uh, where you know people could come in and somehow say, you know, well, if they had it, if, if it wasn't set up correctly and they, and they could vote and they had a large amount and they say, well, we want all the treasury money moved to here for some reason. And then they're, you know, basically defrauding the whole system. So there's those things to think about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've totally gone sideways again. Um, so there's, there's, it's an interesting <laughs> thing, but yeah, our whole, um, our whole sort of um, focus so, here is written so, on the, the environmental so, sort of social side of it yeah i'm just wondering is there is there like a is there a standards body yet for algae you know like is there a global community that is um there's, you know, there's quite governments a number helping of each other out yeah. yeah there's there's things going on globally um so there's different sort of uh societies foundations things like that that are uh, not only trying to raise awareness but they're also yeah trying to bring standards because uh yeah, as you said, you know, you need licensing. You need you, you need to be able to, if you you know, you had a great species, you have to make sure that it also doesn't have some sort of uh, bad impact on on an environment where it could get introduced to. So there are all those things, and then um, you know, food wise, you need there's there's a lot of work needed to bring uh, a new species into that. So you know, making sure it is being regulated and it is, um, you know, so there's a lot of science and research required uh to make that possible as well and that you know that involves money and things like that as well so i mean i ideally we you know we will continue with the research supporting that because this has got such a huge potential we've already seen that but there's there's much more availability there um and yeah the the team we've we've all we're all pushing this and we're all also um I think the world's pretty lucky because we're all uh, we are all trying to do good. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Thanks, we, we you know we, we need to eat, but we would also you know that's being <laughs> being being rich is isn't the main focus. It's actually being able to benefit humanity and the environment, which is a huge driver, especially you know for us. So. Um, I'm sure the team's going to grow and we want to keep that um, ideology. Uh, so, yeah, there's getting back to it, what you were asking, there's a hell of a lot of, um, you know, work required in standardization and regulations for the actual algae side, but that's what we've been dealing with for 15 years. That's what we know. We know those steps. We've done them before. We know how to overcome them or what, what's required and we can provide that. Um, and we make sure that's all up to standard and uh that's where we're specialists so now we can do that um yeah how do we how do we get it to everyone else um yeah that's the that's the cool. the challenging bit for us at this stage yeah and it's it's a different use case for regulation as code <laughs> it's yeah, a very very it's different not, but new <laughs> an exciting opportunity yeah. You are you well, are thanks, asked my my question, Joe. You asked my question around that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested to hear, Angela. You've been thinking about uh, agricultural stuff as well, and so I was wondering if you would like to give us a little rundown of what you've been thinking about. I'd love to. Um, so in fund. Eight, I put up a proposal for dealing with coffee in East Africa. We have a situation where the plant was introduced over a hundred years ago. It's been farmed um, for a long time. We have a lot of old school systems around coffee growing. And the end result is that the farmer doesn't really benefit from any of the profit in the situation. They sell in bulk, 
uh, the middlemen get in the way and then they sell it to a big corporation in bulk and, and it doesn't really work out that your $7 cup of coffee um, has any impact on the actual coffee farmer. So we've been thinking this through. I've been speaking to quite a few farmers in uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. And there are different stories and it's a very interesting thing. There's a lot of history. Um, but what we're seeing more and more of is that because of urbanization and globalization, people who own land are moving towards cities or live in cities and have a piece of land or several acres of land far, far away. And so there's a system where people are leaving a farm worker or a farm manager in charge and then trying to mobile manage the situation from the city. Uh, so it's an urban farming scenario. Um, there's a lot of theft, there's quite a bit of mm, mismanagement, arguments about money. It's, it's messy to have a sort of a landlord, <laughs> lord of the manor thing from very far away. So we've looked into this in Fund 8 from an SSI perspective where we were looking to give the middlemen, the people who buy the coffee from these farmers, um, some sort of identity on the blockchain. We've, we've looked into giving the actual farmers an identity. We've looked into giving the urban farmers identity. Um, that proposal wasn't successful in fund eight. In fund nine, I'm thinking more about looking at it from a perspective of uh, how could we leapfrog into the future and just skip the whole catching up part and just go straight into the next, not necessarily century, but if, if you know what I mean, time-wise, just jump in. Um, because there's such an opportunity to put uh, robotics or, or just AI, just machine learning into a scenario where the, there's sensors on the farm that speak to the farmer, the urban farmer that are just giving information. And if, if we're going with the idea of sensors on the farm, we could have a situation where uh, more information than just how much coffee is grown could be supplied. You could have sunlight, you could have uh, rainfall, we could deal, especially in places like, like Kenya where over the 80s, there was a lot of um, deforestation. The rain patterns have really changed. And so what used to be, you know, for centuries, very solid seasons of rainfall and not drought, but dry seasons and wet seasons have now sort of changed. Um, there's also, you know, as you were mentioning, Dylan, issues with disease and issues with what's the effect of the, the algae on other sort of plants, the biodiversity and its impact. So, uh, several thoughts there, uh, none of which are properly or eloquently <laughs> connected. But the idea is, what if we had a DAP that took photo that, that the farm workers, the farm managers, could take photos of the plants, um, and that information would get sent to the farm owner or the farm manager or the urban farmer and that could just help making better decision better decisions about what to plant if it is it ready for harvest is it where we at with the situation um, building up that sort of data would possibly help these farmers who are at the moment pretty small scale get certification and uh, increase their capacity to export their raw materials. Um, it would be pretty simple use. It's just a photo taking uh, DAP that 
could possibly also diagnose uh, disease in the plants, could possibly also. See you, Felix. Thanks for coming. Um, could possibly also. give the farm worker or the farm manager or whoever's on the farm uh, SSI, you know, an identity on the blockchain. So it could solve several issues, but at the moment it's a bit fuzzy and it's a bit, what, what's one a bit the, vague, but I'm yeah. working what's, on what's, it. What's some of the biggest challenges in the context of say, like Dylan's mentioned the idea of uh, that most people don't know about algae as being a problem. So therefore that's one way and the potentials of algae to develop and be used in lots of different products and all the side or side things. You've got different challenges in uh, the coffee grown regions of the world because it's not just Kenya and Tanzania and stuff. You're basically going across the, the equator, aren't you? You're moving across the equator there. So what's the sort of uh, challenges that are faced in that kind of agricultural setting? You know, Dylan's got um, a $10 million uh, cost to get a, a farm in place. Uh, not many people know about it. Whereas you've got, what is it? Um, there's several thousand smallhold farmers in Kenya alone that are growing coffee already established, uh, but they've got different challenges. What are the, what, what, what are the challenges that face you, that, that face, you face? So the issues um there's there's quite a few issues um there's a situation where the government bodies are not government bodies but certification bodies are really really difficult to get into for a newer person who didn't quite get into get in, into the business 100 years ago or whose family didn't um, so anyone who's attempting to grow coffee, uh, there's a lot of corruption in that system where the, the old people, not people, the old, uh, old school people who bought in the first, first buyers, what, what would it be called? The people who bought in first are gatekeeping. And so there's, there's a lot of, uh, people apply to the certification situation and then the information just kind of disappears. And so there's a challenge in that, not just in coffee, but in quite a few manufacturing, not manufacturing, but agricultural situations, situations with exports, um, where the information just kind of disappears. And so in a corrupt society, not that ours is more or less corrupt than any other society, uh, there's a situation where young farmers or newer players struggle to, once you've put in the application, they really struggle to get information back um, or to, to, to find a situation where they know what's happening with their application or where they are because the system is pretty old school. Uh, I keep saying old. I don't mean old and I'm not being like ageist, but. The, the system is entrenched. Me. You feel me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's an entrenched system that doesn't, and all systems don't like to change. There's a huge amount of inertia associated with them. Um, inertia. Yeah. Um, whether they're corrupt or, or not is as a secondary issue as well. There's a big desire not to change. Uh, Joe's got a question there. Did you want to ask it? Do you want me to uh, repeat it here? It's questions about um, Joe. It. Oh, are the coffee farm farms yeah. workers cooperatives? Are they family owned and run? Are they call farms, grows orchards? So we have a scenario. Uh, yeah, okay, got gotcha. Um, we have a thing where there's regions of particularly fertile soil. Um, a really easy one to talk about is uh, the land around Mount Kenya. Uh, where you know volcanic soil is always very very good there's a lot of coffee growing there there's a similar situation in tanzania with the land around mount kilimanjaro there's a similar situation in uganda why am i forgetting the name of the mountain but they have plenty of mountains 
um, with very, very fertile soil that, that uh, Mount Eligon. Hey. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Mount Elgin. So there's there's a thing where those particular farms of larger size of older origin are well founded and well established, and the ones who are already in are in. However, there's plenty of new players and smaller farmers. So yes, there are societies, there are cooperatives, there are um, coffee growing. Yes, there are, but I'm not looking so much to go as the same way in the same way as Dylan and start a DAO yet. Uh, it's 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 a lot and it's big and I still don't know how to do that. So <laughs> so right now um, we're just working on picking sort of three farms, one or maybe six, maybe like two, one in Uganda, one in Kenya, one in Tanzania, and just sort of testing it out, testing out the idea, um, just seeing what would it take to deliver. Um, these these are uh, sensory kits to East Africa. A could we get them with world shipping and everything? B if they did arrive, <laughs> um, how much information could we gather? How would that look? What what sort of C? How would we actually get internet to these farms? So that's a that's another big one uh, is access to internet connectivity. Um, which is not terrible, but there's a scenario where it's basically based on um, mobile data and sort of minutes. And so there would possibly be a problem where the farm worker is not really interested in being managed by the farm owner and would resist the situation of taking photos on their own data. So a way that we could possibly solve that would have to be something like uh, possibly getting internet onto the farm with the sensors. Um, Starlink, ooh, that's, that's zooming straight ahead, but yeah, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> Uh, they're not currently connected to. They're not currently connected to Africa, but as we were saying, there's an equator situation. Um, it, that, that's possible. It's it's only. It's not that bad to get. <laughs> Sorry, many thoughts. Uh, questions. So so, so there's a, a a thought here that you're going on, which is that you're leapfrogging. So Starlink is definitely leapfrogging. We're going into space. Um, so uh, the there is a leapfrogging. What what and why? What you're implying here is that there's a information deficiency in terms of the management of these small lot farms. But is that a true statement? There's insufficient information. And because you've kind of got the uh, urban farm owners uh, and workers remotely working on these these farms, uh, is how does it currently work in terms of are the owners sort of um, they're from a family background? They've had it for a while. Uh, they need to travel back to those farms on a regular basis. Um, and how long would that be? Um, so just at that level is that would that improve things you and by that I, I think what you're saying is yes but then there's a, a, another question that you was talking I was just sort of thinking about um, some of the things which is related to what Dylan's doing as well is obviously climate related and you mentioned earlier about the change in the environment um, and how it's not so defined now that also implies that uh, there's going to be um, an increase in disease and other forms that affect the growing of these plants? Is that something that we're seeing or 
is that likely to be the case coming through in terms of the change in climate? Go ahead, Dylan. Yeah, hey, um, look, I uh, actually work in agriculture and um, microbiology department at uh, university. And uh, apart from algae, our main focus is on actually uh, crops. I'm not actually in, in that field, but I do hear a lot. And the synergies of like uh, bacteria and things like that in the soil that help the crops. So there's a lot of research being done into that and how the bacteria can benefit the, um, the crop growth. Uh, and obviously that's even more important. As you said, you've been growing these uh, coffee, coffee for, for a long time. So, I mean, they're probably fairly nutrient, um, you know, has been, it's all been extracted and, and what's left. So then you, that, that comes to the old problem of having to uh, fertilize more. And then a lot of that's just leached out and actually doesn't connect. While like a lot of the new studies are showing with uh, introducing uh, it generally, as we said, again, it would be a local identified bacteria that's beneficial and they coexist and they sort of synergize together rather than trying to, as we said, introduce something that won't take. Um, but then if you find that and you can find that, then they uh, boost growth um, with sort of minimal nutrient uh, additives and they can also make this, this, the soil uh, regenerative again. So. There's a lot of, lot of work being done in, in that side of things scientifically, which is, you know, uh, a next step for a lot of agriculture globally. It's like a, it's a huge thing for, for all agriculture. Uh, so I, I um, you know, I'm lucky enough to hear these sort of uh, presentations um, and it, it's definitely something that would be helpful. But I mean, you said a, a lot of things here in there. I mean, if you're taking photos of, um, and this is another thing that we've thought of, if you're taking photos of the plants to, you know, check how they're growing, things like that, um, then there may be opportunity of sort of NFTs for those. Um, and I, I thought that as well. I mean, we do a lot of um, scientific work and if we take, uh, you know, our microscopic photos of algae just to, you know, verify their purity and, and what they are, um, you know, we, we could look at NFTing those as well. And I've discussed that with the team a lot. Uh, and then we're still like, well, who would want that? But look, I mentioned it to a few people and they're like, that's bloody amazing. And, um, you know, I'd buy that. Uh, so it's something that, you know, could also be investigated. Uh, I'm not sure of its um, feasibility, but then there's also, yeah, you've got the problem there of, you know, the, the, the entrenched and the established people having the, you know, the ability to communicate with the authorities and, you know, there's probably money passing back and forth to it, to enable that new players coming along. And, and then I, I've heard uh, in another account where uh, someone was, is looking on Cardano at a, a housing um, sort of ledger in Africa and the problem that, that sort of formed over time in Africa that a lot of, um, families that own the land and things like that, it's not actually written down anywhere. So having to prove, you know, that you own a farm or you own this land can be uh, a thing that in Western society we don't have issues with because we've, it's, all, um, it's already been written down and it's, in, it's, it's somewhere. And now we've got the ability to put that data onto ledgers, which, you know, solidifies that. And then that way people can say, you know, look, I own this land, here's, here's the proof. Um, which is not an ability. So that, that makes it hard, I believe, for farmers where, you know, I guess that would be happening where some people are saying, I own this land and it's like, well, you know, there's no proof of that someone else could come and take it. There could be all sorts of difficulties with that. And that's that would be a, a nightmare. Um, so this, you know, something else to think about. I don't have a solution for these things. I'm just trying a few ideas your way. Um, yeah, so the sensory kits too, yeah, like, I guess it's if you do have the internet, um, you've got the ability then to, you know, up, upload data to, to a ledger. And then, you know, if you've got photos, possibly they could be NFTs. And, and then it would just be a case of making sure that it's a uh, economically viable option um, because, you know, there's different, obviously, um, <clears throat> different economics globally. So some places 
can afford to do things like that and some people can't but um yeah i guess then the next place step is with the the logistics and connecting to um to to the buyers that help you know avoid that middleman step so they can then uh you know send the products uh I, I'm not sure because I, I'd be inclined to think that that once you've grown it, it has to go somewhere for like processing, but maybe maybe not. I'm not. I'm the only work I've looked into in the coffee is at, at the other end when it's being used. And this is one project we were looking for another environmental project. This was before I uh, started working in algae. Actually, I was looking at recycling the. Um, the, the coffee beans because it's it's an amazing um, fertilizer, um, but but that's a that's a whole different story at the at the back end of this. Um, so yeah, there's those those steps with the you know finding new opportunities to to then supply to to people which you know might make the uh, income a little more. Uh, beneficial or you know sustainable so the, the the families of you know getting a little bit more wealth than if they're not you know if they're currently not it's a it's a terrible thing to be working for, for nothing you know and, and finding it hard to make ends meet especially when you're the supplier of you know a product um that's you know a worldwide appreciated product it's, um, it's, a, it's a product that makes this possible the Eastern, Eastern Town Hall possible. Otherwise, I'd be asleep right at the moment. <laughs> oh, what number espresso are you on today, Robert? Uh, number three, that's uh, all. I try to limit it to three. <laughs> <laughs> Only three? Oh, yeah. good. Good on you. <laughs> I'm just wondering, Cash is, are you Jackie? Yes. Hey, we have a farmer in the house. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Um, would you mind explaining to us a, a few more uh, of those, uh, what, what you're going through, what, what the problems are that you're experiencing? Basically, the problems are um, uh, the younger ones are not interested in the coffee like the old ones. Okay, so meaning that if something is not done, the farms could disappear in the future because the older ones are dying also. The other thing is uh, we suffer from land fragmentation. I think uh, that gentleman has talked about it, that uh, land ownership is an issue. We cannot run away from that, it's a fact in Africa. So we need to think about how to help farmers around that. Maybe we may not get a solution like immediately, but it's something we have to look at if you are going to uh, bring technology into farming. It is an issue, a big one. And then um, the other issue is um, we have farms, but uh, labor, paying people to work on the farm is kind of um, costly because you don't get much out of the coffee itself. So many farmers resorted to spraying the weeds. And now we are not sure about the quality of what we use and how much damage it brings to the soil. I believe that if the soil is acidic, definitely the, the bean will also be acidic in a way, and it will not be marketable worldwide. So those are the things we are, we are suffering from. The other thing is uh, when you put farmers, uh, sorry, um, people to work on the farm, at the time of picking, we lose a lot of coffee. They steal, especially if the farm is not close to your home. So at the end of the day, you are stolen on the farm, and then you feel stolen in the process of selling. And <laughs> so it is, it is a big pain, okay? Um, so when now uh, you introduce that sensor stuff uh, idea, I felt, yeah, it could help to have sensors on the ground. First of all, to tell us the, the, the quality of the soil, the nutrients, things like that. Then we can start working on the quality per se. If we keep tracking the quality, then we can go improving other things slowly by slowly. Because if we can tell the temperatures uh, under which the plant is growing, okay, whether the soil is acidic or not, 
then uh, the moisture in the soil, then the plant growth itself and health. Then later on, we can go into the management of the farm. How many workers are there? What do they do on the farm? Because there is where you pay and you really <laughs> not care of what we are paying for you. You understand? Because um, supervising is a challenge. If the sensor can also help in, in the supervision of the workers, then that will be a, a good deal. So let's go for now. That's what I can say. And uh, I'm excited about the sensor, sensor idea. That help us yeah. make better decisions for the funds. Um, Jackie, you, you said um, I'd be interested uh, in you expanding a little bit about the land fragmentation because it's slightly different to what Dylan was talking about, I suspect. This is because um, the land is somewhat um, gets broken up because of the um, succession. Is that the sort of scenario or is it because there just aren't proper records or is it both? Okay, in Uganda, especially in, 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 in the region where I come from, the new practice is, okay, previously, if my father died, for example, he would have a, a big junk of land where the farms are, okay? They would, uh, they would get an administrator and the land would be kept at, by, at bay. Nobody would, would, would take the land. But with the new regulations, if my father dies, then every child has to get a share of his property. So at the end of the day, you realize that you may not be uh, in good relationship with your brothers and sisters. And then at one point you are fighting me, let me get my piece of land, let me get my piece of land. When you share, definitely some are going to sell. And that becomes a what? A challenge. So you realize the farm that was say 10 acres, when they share among us five, everybody gets two acres. And then after a few years, it's only two people remaining and the rest sold and buildings are coming up. So that is the situation here. So this, this is actually uh, very similar to a sort of scenario. Not um, We've got a similar scenario here in New Zealand with the Māori land. We actually have three different types of thai, property title, of land title, I should say. Uh, one is your typical European title. Another is a customary title, which is unregistered in any form for Māori. Uh, and the third is what is called Māori land, which is administered by the Māori land court. And this idea of succession and the fragmentation is, has been an ongoing problem for over a century. One of the solutions here was to amalgamate lots of the land and therefore we have special um, organizations that are kind of membership organizations uh, that enable those, that land to be administered and they're administered in the context of typical corporate, Western corporate governance. Although that is uh, changing, I've got a whole book on changing rules over there. Um, but uh, what it does do as well is um, it actually means because decisions can't be made on a lot of the uh, land, um, nothing gets done with it. And um, it also can't be uh, improved in terms of put into agricultural purposes and things like that, because they can't get access to any financing because it's um, kind of sitting in this gray area. It can't be what, what the legal system refers to as it cannot be alienated. It can't be removed from the indigenous owners. And so this causes all sorts of problems. And one of the things that I think um, where uh, the notions of DAOs and of governance and stuff could actually radically improve land title administrative administration in a way that the scenario that you've just described there, Jackie. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. That's not what um, Angela was talking about, but it's certainly one thing. Um, I was interested in... Um, this idea of uh, supervision, uh, labor costs, and you know, because it, it, the labor costs have basically caused spraying, and because you're not getting much of the money, uh, and you haven't got the supervision, you're getting stealing, which which means you also get far less uh, money for your crops growing. So I'm interested here is this notion that Angela's just 
uh, introduced earlier on, which is the idea of just being able to take photos at various different points of different things happening within the farm. So we've mentioned the idea of taking photos of the plants themselves, which can um, we could potentially therefore build up a data set that enables us to identify the um, uh, growth patterns of, of the plants themselves, identify or and even estimate production of the cherries on the trees. Uh, we could then look for disease of those um, uh, on those plants. We can then go into the secondary stages when they're harvested and drying. Again, we can uh, just take photos and start to build up patterns of what's going on there. That will give you another quantifying metric around the um, estimated production. Uh, the third thing is also once you actually bag those green beans up and things like that, you've got an understanding of how much of the actual sacks of beans and stuff that you've got. So you can get an estimate of basically what the farm should be producing versus what actually goes to market. Um, and I'd be uh, that simple idea of just taking a photograph and being able to, in a consistent way, is the main thing, which I'm assuming here, of course, that workers have got phones. That's one thing. Um, and that the uh, phone, uh, smartphone capable is uh, another. Um, you brought up the point, Angela, that uh, they are unlikely to use it um, to uh, on their own data. But there's also an opportunity because you've got these interactions, take a photo here, take a photo there, take a photo there. Um, these are actually can form part of the compensation plan. Remember, fundamentally, what we've got in front of us in terms of a blockchain is a really efficient bookkeeping system really super efficient at recording both the information that's or the events that have occurred in an irrefutable manner and also as part of that providing compensation that goes out uh, through activities that have been done so I'm, I'm curious is that um, just taking photos like that on a phone whereby if you don't get you know if you don't do your photo taking rounds that you're supposed to do then you don't get paid uh, would that help with things like supervision, um, the labor costs, the effects of that, and the stealing? Does that make sense, uh, Anthony? Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Otieno. I'm okay. coming from. The, uh... Okay, this is my first time here to the end of the, the breakout sessions. I've, I've joined the meeting before, but I've largely been on uh, the plenary sessions, not up to this meeting of the breakout. But I'm also happy to be here. And uh, it has been it, it'll be a challenge for me because of the scheduling time. Most of the Saturdays is when I have classes where I, where I usually lecture here in Kenya. But I wanted to chip in and share more about the coffee in Kenya since I'm coming from Kenya about the coffee, the challenges about uh, agriculture sector. I've done some systems on coffee management system, not, not really on coffee, but uh, on the agriculture sector, whereby we are trying to see how we can mitigate some of the issues that farmers are having in uh, Kenya. Uh, if you look at the agricultural sector in Kenya, even Africa in uh, general, you realize that uh, much of the produce come from the small scale farmers. And the small scale farmers are, uh, they, they may not have, the small scale farmers is basically looking at the size of the land that they have. Uh, historically, the ones who have the biggest chunk are uh, quite few in the market, but the advantage they have is that they have an extensive uh, value chain. A value chain in the sense that they have the bigger farm, they have the larger produce, and then they also have the machinery for processing and uh, packaging the products. So when the, with the big farm and the processing infrastructure, they're able to sell thing on sell the products on mass and even at cheaper cost, reducing the basically competing uh, better than the small scale farmers. Whereas the, whereas the small scale farmers who have the smaller farms may not have the infrastructural investment that can uh, actually do the process the farming, uh, also under the storage processing of the products and also. Uh, another challenge which they, 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 they tend to have is that when they are producing the product, or when they are actually when they are 
reaping the products from the farm, they tend to they, they tend to depend heavily on the natural uh, 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 climate. For example, right now there is a shortage of maize in Kenya because all, all farmers, uh, all, all the small scale farmers are farming. By the time they are, the, the maize are ripening and about to be harvested, all the farmers in Kenya will be harvesting the maize. So we end up with a lot, a lot of waste in terms of maize, in terms of coffee, in terms of uh, uh, most of the cash crop products. So some of so the issues they are having is that the small scale farming, the size of the land, uh, does, not, does not guarantee them to have access to financial su support to ensure that they can, uh, to support them in getting infrastructural investment, for example, processing farms and processing machines to assist them in re reducing the cost of processing product and also the storage. Uh, secondly, is that they, they also lack the aspect of uh, traceability, which is a very critical uh, component in, in the global market. For example, are you able to trace the coffee, the, the coffee uh, from the Java, the Java coffee that you're drinking to where it came from? If the small case farmer, so small, small scale farmer, it becomes a difficult uh, experience. Uh, it becomes a difficult even for them to negotiate. So they have to use middlemen uh, to cover the, cover that for them. I want to cover, cover up, cover up that for them. But the large scale uh, farmers who historically have been farming for the past hundred years have that advantage over the small scale farmers. So that's the the, the bigger challenge. One is the comparison of the size of the land. So historically, the, the ones who have, who have the, the biggest farm have a, a better advantage over the small-scale farmers. Uh, now, if based, based on the analogy which I shared earlier on is that African uh, food security is uh, largely dependent on the small-scale farmers, how do we ensure that they are uh, they, they get the they get uh, the value for their products, and also how do we ensure that there's uh, limited waste? Of produce during harvesting because all of them harvest at the same time. Another thing is how do we ensure that there is a aspect of traceability? That's when the that's where the aspect the the technology such as blockchain come in so that we can trace uh, the 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 produce from the time it, the, the the planting season. Uh, also adding the concept of sensors whereby you're able to 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 monitor and record the climate. Uh, uh, environment in, in the, the where, where the farming is taking place, you can able to mo monitor the soil pedology, looking at the pH value of the soil. So that you can it can because most of these improve most of these are factored on the quality of the crop. The quality of the co coffee is dependent on the soil uh, the soil quality, the, the pH value as well. So all these are measured and are factored into and recorded. Such that by the time the coffee is produced, all the uh, all the information that uh, all the information that were processed during the, uh, the planting are recorded somewhere. So then for, for with, with this information, you can actually now um, peg a price uh, for, the, for the farmer. Uh, secondly, uh, is that the technology that uh, we, we are actually working on here, that's the blockchain technology, can be integrated with other technology, for example, the artificial intelligence, the internet of things, to ensure that they are, to ensure that a farmer can be able to, to sustain their uh, their development. Now the challenge will be in the implementation. For example, the small scale farmers may not have the money to invest on this infrastructure. So uh, let's say for for example, Angela is trying to uh, build a system to uh, to mitigate some of this. The the better approach will be to build a cooperative association whereby the small scale farmers can come to you to, uh, to have their farmers and their, their products registered in the system that you have. And then from there, you can, uh, let's say, use a drone. Instead of using, taking pictures, use a drone to fly across all the farms. And uh, all those, so let's say, for example, is it, it, it's possible to manage a whole chunk of land, individual, as, what we don't, as, as one person with the current technologies. The hiccups we are having that, uh, I don't know about other countries, but in Kenya, for you to operate a drone, you, you must have a pilot license, which is, a bit, which is another hiccup. But there's a special uh, pilot license for drones, but the, the cost is still the same, the investment is still the same. So those are some of the hiccups that farmers may not uh, invest individually. So coming up as a, a developer, and then establishing a cooperative that where farmers can register, 
and tap into the technology that you have already built. Then from there, uh, they can be able to uh, uh, properly manage their farms. So integrating the, te the, the blockchain technology, integrating the Internet of Things, uh, the, some of the, the modern technology which have been uh, regulated, for example, the drones, uh, artificial intelligence, which is uh, always uh, changing on a daily basis. So all this can be can be integrated, but uh, it requires some it requires some sense of innovation to ensure that we can circumvent the regulation in Kenya. We can circumvent the challenges the farmers are uh, having. Uh, we, we can also ensure that if a farmer is not able to uh, to uh, let's say purchase the infrastructure, we can bring them all all together and then invest in one system such that all of them can benefit in that. And then by the, uh, another thing is that if, if they are all managed, if they are all managed as one group, then uh, it may be treated as one type of crop, or uh, okay, it, can, it may be treated as one uh, crop with the same traceability. So that's all I wanted to share. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Anthony. That's a lot. Um, that's really informative. Um, one of the things I, I picked up from what Angela was saying was that um, you know we can we need to sort of start on this sort of thing. How do we get sensors integrated with a blockchain and the environment that Jackie's brought up in terms of like supervision, succession, labor costs, and things like that? And I think um, would that be a correct assessment, Angela, in terms of what you're thinking? This is for your proposal work as let's explore this idea more, let's develop what we can do to begin with? Yeah, because it's a, a large scale problem um, just with the current situation of the world. And so, uh, as Charles says, grab a shovel. So I've grabbed a shovel. <laughs> uh, and here is the very, very basic idea um, on, on idea scale. Um, I'm still working on it, but feel free to uh, <laughs> subscribe and watch it get better. And thanks, Anthony. That's actually really interesting, the idea of um, working with cooperatives. But to begin, let's just work with just a few farms and sort of do research. Just research the idea, research whether what we're proposing is possible, whether it's, um, you know, then maybe in, in another fund, we could, we could uh, take it bigger because its potential is huge. It's not just coffee, it's not just uh, Kenya, it's, it's, you know, if we're going with coffee, it's Vietnam, it's Indonesia, it's um, Brazil. If we're going with the equator, there's coconuts and, uh, plenty of other products <laughs> that could be put through a similar. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, basi it's basically so, smart food production, isn't it, really, is how can we use technology to uh, increase both the efficiency and the quality of uh, the food production while also reducing the burden on the environment in which it grows or making it uh, more like what Dylan was bringing up in terms of uh, the bacteria and um, other forms into the soil. The soil is so important to the production of uh, our food, uh, certainly coffee and avocados and related sort of things. Uh, that by, as uh, Jackie brought up, the spraying causes damage both to the plants, lowers the quality of the, the plants themselves, but also it gets leached into the soil and kills off the soil. So um, can we uh, use technology and this is my interpretation of it, use technology to bring us back to more regenerative kind of processes uh, of, of how we produce our food, and while at the same time increasing the quality and quantity of that food being produced. And more importantly, which is a topic that's come through loud and clearly with Dylan, and indeed with the, the idea of young people not being interested in farming and stuff like that, is actually can we make it sustainable as a livelihood, interesting as a profession, um, and 
um, generally just good for everyone uh, as much as possible, rather than the rape and pillage that kind of happens within the industrial uh, food system at the moment. Uh, and I really like what um, Dylan was saying about climate change as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that's coming through here from what Anthony said and what Angela and Dylan have sort of brought up, and I'm, I'm curious, um, is the role of science in all of this? And this is, um, you know, this is somewhat related. I'm going to have another question with, with you, Dylan, hey, and we'll just probably take this NFT idea a little bit further. Um, one of the, uh, and also I just want to acknowledge Anthony, I, I think from where Angela has been talking is that this is the base level and over time we can bring in things like drones and satellites and other sort of things to inform the, uh, the rich set of information. And that rich set of information then helps science. Um, because it feeds back in, the higher the quality of that data collection, uh, the more science can rely on it. And so, um, you know, can we um, uh, lower the cost of deploying sensors and monitoring uh, our agricultural environment uh, such that the veracity, veracity or the quality of the data coming off them can be used in scientific endeavors more effectively. I'd be interested uh, your thoughts, Dylan, on um, this is effectively amounting to precision agriculture uh, and the effects of it, and also somewhat dovetailing with the idea of uh, citizen science as well, um, which you know, two kind of ones in industrial mode, ones are sort of ad hoc, everyone coming to it. What um, opportunities do you might see existing uh, for doing agricultural science with rich data sets coming from lots of different places. And this is kind of where I see the intersection with the NFT stuff coming together. Might be quite interesting. Or oh, wondering what your thoughts on that, that proposition might be. Yeah, okay. Well, um, first of all, I, I think a lot of what Anthony covered is, you know, the goal, the goal. And I mean, a lot of that must feed into what you think too, Angela, with, with what you're trying to do. And, and I mean, I think with what Angela is saying is, you know, it, it needs to be, it needs to be scalable. And that's, that's the same with our things. I mean, like the idea of a $10 million farm, although it seems like a lot for a sort of uh, blockchain project, uh, physically, like that's a, that's a small amount. That's the first step. And then you go up and up and up until, you know, you've got a hundred million dollar farm or whatever. But in, in, in this case with, um, yeah, like the citizen science part of, of all the little farms being able to get together, uh, get the required photos, um, obtaining the knowledge of like what photos are required, what's helpful, what's not. Um, and that can also play into, as you said, I thought that was a great idea for, um, uh, for the, the workers. So that's sort of, covering the supervision that's a like a that's a, a a very good idea so if they have the ability to take photos and they do the right photos then that can justify you know their work time and what they did and then that can be laid out in, in a in a fashion where you know they they take certain types of photos and then of the product or whatever i guess it depends on the stage of production and, and harvesting but but that can all be interlaid and then if there's a whole uh, sort of governing Body, which sort of acts like as the middleman still informs all the parties of what data is required and all that data goes to a ledger and then that data can then yeah go on to the nfts so it's blocked in to uh, the ledger or metadata somewhere to be re like retrieved and that data then can be sent what's what's required from scientists to gather um, whether it be the photos themselves and then also look that the NFTs could have, you know, as you said, the, the pH, the, the climate, it, it could be linked to the day and that could be linked to another API. So you could look up the, the weather forecast for that day if it's in place. I mean, a lot of this sort of accounts for things being in place that, you know, um, you know, we may take for granted. I mean, we have a fairly good 
uh, weather system here in Australia, and, and I guess it would be the same in New Zealand. And I'm not sure if that is that sort of things even available. But then, uh, as we go and they, you know, these things are required, then I think they will be implemented um, in a more succinct fashion. I mean, if you if you're trying to put data onto a blockchain somewhere to not only help the people, but, you know, give that to the scientists so then they can feed back information of way improving the agriculture. And that would also help with all the small farms if they're all, um, you know, harvesting at the same time because of the, that's the environmentally best time to do it. Then you could somehow say, okay, no, hang on, you hold off, you, you do that this day, you do that this day, you do that this day. So there's not that waste. There's that sort of, um, to, total sort of system work where all the little players are working in the big system, even though, you know, um, I'm not sure of the challenges in that, you know, uh, for the for the workers and the operators, you know, because if it is raining, whatever, and you can't do it that day. But, but I mean, I guess a, a system that sort of guides people. So all the products of the whole small farms isn't happening on the same particular day which just floods the market and then everyone loses if that can be explained then you know that's a benefit too but um yeah i think if the practical uses for nft make a lot more sense to me as like a, a engineer uh if that if nfts have got data in them that helps uh the people that are using them and also helps scientists and helps to improve agriculture as a, a whole and then you can do this as you said, for for the, the coffee, and then you can move to other sectors. Um, and as people advance, you know, and see that bigger systems can be built around that for, you know, a more sustainable planet, um, which is, you know, pretty good for everyone, <laughs> making the world a better place. Um, yeah, it's just doing these steps. I, um, you know, I, my thoughts on NFTs are more based on, you know, land titles, um, things that have practicality. I mean, in the future, I do foresee that everything you buy would be linked to a ledger. Um, and, you know, I, I would rather that be a decentralized ledger where you have then the power over what information can be gathered from that um, rather than sort of a centralized ledger that, someone's controlling and they can sell off what they want um but that's that's a whole different can of worms to what we're talking about yeah but one, the, yeah one of the interesting you go. things that just popped into my head while you're talking there is that actually if you are we often think of the data being collected up with respect to supply chains but what was just i was just thinking through there was actually there's actually a revenue source on those NFTs if they're linked to data, because if those, if that um, data is used to justify a carbon credit, right, a, a, a volunteer carbon credit that is then sold, then revenue from that can filter right through back to the uh, farmers. You know, that's the sort of thing. And when you were talking about um, the coordination of, of production processes and stuff like that, that actually ties into a proposal I put in in Fund 2, which is uh, about smart markets, which is basically uh, to do coordination, to use market systems, auctions, basically, to coordinate the best times, because you've got a lot of variables um, to actually decide where and when to actually harvest. Um, some might want to uh, do it right now and therefore are prepared to pay slightly more. Some are prepared to wait with the risk of weather and those sort of probabilities coming into it. So you can effectively uh, price um, or auction off harvesting slots or production slots uh, in a fair way to achieve mac the maximum, and what economists refer to as maximum welfare. Uh, because this is no pipe dream, because this is exactly what's done for airport landing slots that are auctioned off. This is what's done for mobile phone um, uh, broad, uh, bandwidth um, spectrum that are auctioned off. Water is done like this. Gas and stuff like that is all uh, auctioned off like this. And it's, uh, uh, you might say you're using 
when you hear the word auction and market, you might be thinking, oh, people are buying and selling. No, what's actually happening is people are pricing um, what they believe is most important to them to try and find what is the best combination of things. And that's that's what was in fun too, to actually use NFTs uh, for uh, supply chain, for marketplace systems. So this is uh, another good little use case for it. Uh, well, not a little use case, it can be actually quite significant because as Anthony brought up, access to capital is a big problem. Why not? Sh and often that's to do with um, the need for production capacity and stuff like that. Why not uh, uh, use the data to improve that? Why not use uh, auctions and things like that to improve uh, the, the allocation of resources? And therefore you can more easily share resources in that sort of way. So that, those are some of the sort of things that popped up when you were just in, popped into my head when um, you were talking. So the potential for this sort of thing is quite quite large, really. Yeah, be, it's kind of quite exciting. <laughs> yeah. uh, any thoughts, Anthony, um, on uh, the use of data from your perspective, the use of data beyond just the farm, beyond just the, the urban uh, farm owner or anything else like that? Is there any other thoughts on how the collection of data could be used to increase the agricultural sector in Kenya. Yeah, sure. Actually, there's a lot of uh, use cases where, where we can use data to support beyond the coffee and to add agricultural sector. But let me let me give a case of a different project which I've worked on. Uh, it's called the Community Networks. Uh, maybe you've heard about it. Mm -hmm. uh, community is uh, just a, a it's more like the democratizing the concept of internet connectivity uh, where uh, to support, support or facilitate the marginalized community to have access to the internet for uh, sustainable de development. And the, the major focus where we have been working on is not on aggregate, but on education. So the implementation approach that we chose was that we, the first thing you do, you have to, you have to do the mapping of the institution, public institution, schools, hospitals, the police stations, all, all, those, all those, and then you have to get the co exact coordinates and then put them on a map, a digital map, so that uh, you can do the, the what's called the, 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 you can determine the type of technology you're going to implement in different zones, because they, based on the, based on the, uh, the layout of the land, uh, there may be different technologies to be deployed and different data to be transmitted and different uh, data types to be transmitted. In regions where there's low connectivity, or, or uh, where there's uh, in regions where by less there's, there's no 4G or 5G network, you may be forced to use uh, 2G, and the type of data that you're going to transmit would be, would be different. So, after doing the mapping, we did the mobilization of uh, infrastructure, lobbying to the uh, regulators to ensure that the type of they, they can give us some leeway with the regulation, uh, so that, uh, for example, the type of spectrum to be used. To, uh, to to facilitate specifically the marginalized community. Now, for the uh, in the agricultural sector, we can adopt the same model. Uh, the first thing you don't work with the cooperative; you develop you develop your own cooperative as association. Why cooperative? Uh, because of the just just for the legal compliances. The approach: uh, if register company, then you may have to uh, adhere to strict legal compliances. And like a cooperative, because in cooperative you are trading for the benefit of the members, the benefit of the farmers, such that you are you are you're not only limiting yourself to the farmers who are focusing on coffee, but other uh, other farmers, for example, those are focusing on maize, because there are larger plantation in, uh, in the Rift Valley Belt that that are focusing on uh, let's say uh, maize and uh, other crops, then horticulture. So in with the type of data. One is that once the mapping is done and you have gotten access to that, you have actually demarcated the perimeter of the farmers that you are going to support or facilitate, then you can now pick the next technology how, or the best free technology, which is affordable and also convenient for the farmer. Uh, also, it uh, ensures that the, it, there's some aspect of, uh, you, how do I put it, but you reduce, okay, the concept is to reduce the cost of production, the cost of processing, and also the cost of uh, 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 marketing. So that by the time 
So let's say if 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 you have maize in the Rift Valley, the Rift Valley Belt from Ethiopia to southern part, there, yet there's lack of maize in Uganda. Then the peop, the people in Uganda maybe should be having that information that the maize is available. Then how do we access it there? So because, that, because that, that's that's what the lack of information and the lack of data we processed to ensure that the consumers are aware that the, this kind of crop is available in this particular region is what lead to the wastage of crops. So th that data is also that the data for that uh, to be processed to ensure that the information for available pro agricultural products is is uh, okay. There's a I don't put there's a lack of uh, data, uh, real time data. Okay, the key, the key term is real time data uh, to be processed, which ensure, which lead to the wastage of uh, which wastage of, uh, of of agricultural produce. Now, in the implementation, it will also be important to uh, yeah, focusing on the, uh, the, the, key, the critical aspect is we have the small scale farmers and the, the challenge they're having is that they're heavily focused on agricultural, uh, not, not the, the, the climatic uh, conditions, like that if there's no rain, they will not uh, plant and they have to wait for rain. Uh, and also, uh, how do we ensure that if there's water somewhere or, or in any mechanism, for example, a borehole or a well or a dam is built, water can be pumped with a specific quantity to the farm to, suffer, to support the small scale farmers uh, so that it, the, there's no excessive uh, 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 climatic condition or there's no excessive, uh, uh, how do you call it? The, the, there's no excessive. Uh, Mm, how do you categorize water? And, okay, the, 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 okay. The point, the point is, you don't put too much, you don't uh, supply too much water to the soil to damage the crop or other other, other components. For example, uh, apart from water, so the critical aspect is that oh, which also brings me to another point: the farmers, the small case, the small scale farmers, do not have the knowledge of. Uh, Next generation farming. So this digital, the, the, digit, the digitization of a farming mechanism gives the farmers the ability and the knowledge to ensure that how do they manage the pests which are affecting the crop in real time, not just when it has when it's acquired. The, 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 it, it's, it, it's very easy to predict. So in real time, they are able to manage the, the pests and the which are damaging the crop. They're able to manage the weeds. They have the information on how to, to do that. Uh, Another aspect is that they are able to. I'm, I'm just lacking, lacking the correct term to the to explain this, <laughs> but okay. The the data which they they're lacking, the is that how do we digitize the farming process processes such that farmers are able to have access to this information in real time, and uh, in in the process of farming. Once they have the, the correct the correct uh, farming uh, uh, procedures, then uh, they're even that, they're even able to ensure the, to, to ensure their farms. Because another another challenge which they are having is that farmers, the small scale farmers, do not have access to insurance uh, schemes or uh, covers uh, because of the, that lack of information. The, the large scale farmers have that uh, because they are able to they, they have the, uh, an extensive uh, infrastructure and value chain. That, that the kind of information they have is what the insurance uh, companies have that uh, covers them. So for that, the, the insurance company can, can cover them in case of any uh, calamity. But the small, case, the small scale farmers, due to la that lack, lack of information and lack of data, they may not be able to seek uh, insurance uh, uh, schemes. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very, so I've, I've not put them in a, in a appropriate order, but the, the type of data is necessary. The data processing is necessary for the farmers to be aware of the type of how to manage their crop. Uh, secondly, is that it's also very critical for the government. The, the kind of information that uh, that is going to be processed can be put in an open as an open data for the government to have access to, so that they can be able to. Uh, uh, since, since most of the most of the African countries have devolved governance, they're able to uh, plan accordingly. With the, with, the, with the information that is shared as open data, 
through this platform that we're building. Uh, so for, for that, the, 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 the stakeholders here is the government, the financial sector, who, who, may be, who may be facilitate the farming, even the farmers themselves and the consumers. So they have different data needs, they have different information uh, categories and different data types to be, to be consumed. But the processing of data is very, very critical. And uh, the most important aspect is, can this data be provided in real time rather than after uh, activities have occurred? So can this data be provided in, in real time? What, what does our real what does real time mean to you in terms of it can like within an hour, within the second that it was taken, or within twenty four hours? What what does it mean by real time? Real time real time data means that uh, the second it was taken, it has be uh, transmitted and processed. Now it may depend with the with the kind of data which is uh, which is uh, uh, which is uh, which is shared, but the real time data let's say for the, the if we take example of uh, the water management in an irrigation farm then that has to be real data real, real, real time data taken as and when it is as and when it, it has occurred however insurance uh, farms may want historical data which shows a graph uh, government stakeholders may also want uh, historical data that for for this period when the farming took started uh, the farming was uh, started up to the harvesting uh, how was the farming activity undertaken so they, they they may want historical data which may be up to, for a period of time but the real-time actual farming for example uh, manage, management of uh, water in a farm must be real time management of pests management of uh, hub, uh, hubs may, may be must be real time so another thing is also we also, we also depend on the kind of technology we use because some technology may be expensive. For example, if you send that in as, a, as an SMS, then they'll charge you by SMS. But if you send them, then if you, but if you create a community network, uh, infrastructure whereby, uh, like what, 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 what I've done before is setting up a Wi-Fi uh, network in, as, in a town. So that may, may, that may limit the, that may reduce the cost for transmission there. So it, it may, Support real-time data connection, but that real da real-time data means as and when as and when it occurs. But right. it also depends on the information you're sharing. Yeah, um, there's also uh, it's real-time. Uh, the the need for the data is relative, as you're bringing up, relative to the person that um, or the entity that needs it. And so, like on the farm, there might be a need for uh, real-time data immediately. Uh, but the insurer doesn't need that immediately. They need historical data that they can go back through and have a look at. Um, so this would also imply one of the things uh, that's common, for example, um, is that my audio or yours uh, going bouncing? Um, one of the things that's common is this idea of uh, delayed delivery. So it might be real time locally, say to the farm, but it only has to be, it can be batched up and sent up to the cloud or something on a um, less frequent basis. It doesn't have to be fully connected. And this is something that, um, you know, obviously a blockchain does itself uh, is replicate in a decentralized network uh, by replicating, by copying stuff going around. So that if your connectivity gets lost, you can still uh, upload it later and it doesn't change the integrity of it. Uh, so uh, I've noticed here, Angela, you're talking about using uh, local servers, I think and it's, um, yeah. Um, so that would be a really good use case or a, a justification for doing those, uh, rather than always having to be connected up into the uh, internet and re reasonable connectivity. Um, Jackie, I was just wondering if you wanted to pass any sort of comments. We've just gone past the uh, two hour mark. So I do want to go to bed. Uh, <laughs> despite I could keep talking for a while, but uh, uh, being up at five o'clock in the morning means that I'm starting to fade. Uh, but so Jackie, uh, any thoughts from the conversation that uh, you, you have had or that have interest you or? Yeah, uh, the whole idea of, um, of bringing technology into farming, especially coffee is so exciting especially the putting the sensors in the farm 
I realized that uh, if we sit well with Angela and um, look at the parameters to consider, this information is going to be helpful, not only to us, the farmers, but to the scientists, okay? Because they are the ones that um, work on the, say, what we used to spray and all that. I think they'll be in a better place to provide better products for farmers. And then um, to the people in the market, because if I'm going to sell my coffee in, in your country, for example, I believe that interested buyers would want to know the quality of the product. So if you have a track of record of how this whole thing started, how it is grown, what temperatures, the pH, you know, it helps a lot. And I believe that uh, a lot of people will benefit in this whole thing. So I'm excited about this proposal. And I believe um, everyone is going to benefit in their way. We just need to keep uh, talking and putting ide ideas together so that we can bring it out well. Yeah, there was, um, you just made me think of something, Jackie, here, that there was um, a really, really interesting proposed rule change coming through from uh, the SEC in the United States. A really super interesting one. Um, it's been proposed by uh, the SEC, and what it's requiring is that all American companies must do full climate disclosure. And it's broken up into three areas. The first area is your standard, you know, uh, watch your footprint directly. But what's most interesting is the third one, which is um, an area which is you've got to report full disclosure of all your information about your product's value chain, right? Now that's okay, that's cool, but it's not excluding, or basically that means banks too. And the products of banks are financial products. The products of insurance companies are financial insurance products. Um, and therefore these banks and stuff like that must do full disclosure um, of their products, which means that any investments that they make must also do full disclosure, uh, which means that they need data about not just the footprint of the small lot whole farmer, but how that information aggregates up right through the entire value chain to report over just climate information. Now that's not including biodiversity, that's not including the social elements or anything else like that. But if you're just doing climate related work, the mere fact that um, banks might be required to do this, let's say it gets passed and everything, which it won't, but let's just say that it did, then effectively every, um, uh, all the disclosure requirements would be required for an information supply chain on climate related issues, it wouldn't take much to include biodiversity and social issues as well, any of that. Now, it won't get passed, but the mere fact that it has been pushed out is uh, an immediate uh, warning to banks and other uh, financial institutions across the globe that the US are thinking about doing this. And because the US is fundamentally the center of capital in the world, it tends to have a bit of an impact on everyone, um, whether you like it or not. And so this is a, a good example of how collecting high quality data at source, even if it sounds like just a photograph, but you've got this idea of fingerprinting it or building up veracity over time uh, can be used in so many different ways uh, to actually lift uh, value up on that that side of things so it'd be really interesting um there was something else in there that i forgot I, i've done a dylan which is I've, i was thinking of something and <laughs> brain was going off on another tangent um uh but oh that's right um no I've, oh anthony i had a question just immediately and this will be the last one everyone um around the water water management um, and Jackie, if you could answer this as well, or think about this one. Um, now, we do have like smart valves and things like that that we can put in infrastructure to improve the irrigation. But one of the things that uh, Angela has touched on, and indeed 
um, is this, and you have Jackie as well, is this idea of capability building, this ability to actually put this sort of stuff in place and use it, maintain it, operate it, and things like that. Uh, doing a water irrigation system seems like quite a hard, it hits that quite firmly. Is that true or false or, you know, uh, somewhere in between? Any thoughts? Uh, yes. Oh. So what water management is also quite critical in, uh, in the agricultural sector and uh, a smart water management would be the best uh, with, with a better approach, which also requires uh, which also requires some aspect of automations. In in the year 2018, I recall, I'd uh, done an, an, a workshop on Internet of Things here in Nairobi with the Huawei, we were hosted by Huawei, and actually we are with a, a lady called Anne Gatenda. That was in 2018. And we were presenting a, a water management system. We, we used to call it Smart Magic. But it was largely for for homes, uh, small, let's largely the small scale uh, uh, institution, homes and uh, farms, whereby if you have a water tank or a underground tank or something like that, uh, you could pump water uh, digitally from the from any any part of the world, any part of the world. So the the once the water, well, let's say once once the water tank has drained. You could just uh, the, the system itself could, could detect that the water tank is dry, and start pumping water into the tank in, into the from the well or the one other source or from the river into the water or the the, the raised water tank, and uh, from there it can be used for the for the farming. So the management, the building of such such kind of technology is not quite difficult with the Internet of Things. However, the integration of that uh, technology with other user environment, for example, farming, is where we require some more information. Uh, we now require that uh, uh, the sensors be now put place on the soil, which can detect the level of pH value. If the pH value is quite high, then it can be regulated by water. If the water is quite, if the soil is quite dry, it can be uh, hydrated by water. So the, it, it becomes automated. However, the pumping on the and the holding of the water, that's quite easy to build. Now, the, the difficult part is the integration of this smart water management system with the, with the other environmental uh, uh, usage. Uh, it can be farming, it can be a household use. So, so, so that's, that, that's why we need more and more sensors to ensure that that can be managed. Now, then another, another aspect is that you may need a now centralized dashboard to, for the user to, code, to control that. So that, that's 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 that. If I was to do it, that's how I would do it. So I would put sensors on the on the where the source the source of the water. Then I would put sensors more more and more sensors on the on this on the farming environment. So then that can be coordinated uh, from a central dashboard. So if I, that's that my 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 model, model of implementing the water management, so I would call it more like a smart water management system. Yeah, that's cool. I think. Can you um, just, uh, I know I said that was going to be my last question, but one more, because um, <laughs> I, I was just thinking of something. Um, this, Jackie, this, you brought up the idea of the youth, young people not being interested on the farms, and therefore if they don't do anything, they'll lose it, and the you know, wealth that's both the cultural wealth, I'm assuming, and also the fam familiar, the family wealth, etc., will be diminished over time. Do you think that um, things such as applying smart water management or smart farming to uh, a farming environment like yours would uh, interest a lot of young people to come back or encourage them to come back? I believe so, because uh, why I'm believing so is uh, every young person is interested in IT related stuff. Everyone is having a phone somewhere smart or otherwise, and everyone is trying to learn how to, to survive in this new world. So I believe that if we do something around farming, connected to phones and, and technology, I believe that would draw quite a number of youths to participate. I think what they don't want is, um, they realize it's too much work to work on the farm, and then there is too little to get out of the farm. 
So the attitude of the young ones is they want to get rich quick with less work or doing something which is not really requiring a lot of sweating, but can give them something. Yeah, so that is the mind of the youth now. So if we can get something that can accommodate their kind of um, thinking and uh, perception of life, then I believe we could help quite a lot to get into farming. And that is a lovely note to finish on. Thank you there, Jackie, and thank you everyone else. And uh, Joe is heading off and I need to go to uh, get some moi, some sleep um, as well myself. But um, thank you for the great conversation. Lovely meeting you, Dylan. Lovely meeting you, I'm Anthony. really looking forward to your yeah. pr proposal, Dylan. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yep, yeah. I've got yours bookmarked now so I can look through. Where where are you at, Robert? You're not in um, New Zealand then, are you? Or? Yes, I'm in New Zealand. I'm in uh, Tauranga, New Zealand, Yeah, on the North Island. Yeah. What's the time there now? Wouldn't it only be like 11? Yeah, it's 11 o'clock, but I've been up since 5 a.m. this morning. <laughs> ah, I get you. Yeah, I thought you were saying it's 5, and I'm like, I'm not making much uh, sense here. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, there's a lot of good ideas. I like... Um, uh, what Anthony was talking there, I mean, uh, that's a lot of work. That sounds like a lot of, um, I mean, it's achievable. It's just a lot of uh, control processing work, mm. um, getting that automation to work and getting getting it on the systems where it's accessible. I mean, that's definitely something that we're working on too with our systems. Um, and the more you can do, you know, remotely and check, on, check in on farms, uh, that's, that's the sort of standards we're looking at. So, I mean, that that sort of work can be implemented to any farms where it's required and and, and um, an advantage. Yeah, so it's all good work. Yeah, it was good meeting everyone. Yeah, likewise. And that's why I like um, Angela's approach, which is start small, get uh, see what we can do with the, uh, one or two, maybe three farms. And learn from those first and foremost rather than trying to dive in that's right and, and then you everything. have to make sure that those they work mm -hmm. and then once you can see the outcome is is good that's where you continue otherwise yeah mm -hmm. if you go too big you can burn it out and it's you've missed a step somewhere uh so yeah it's a very good process that was cool. yeah, well thank you very much lovely to meet you all it's been lovely to spend the, the two hours with you this evening and uh I'll catch you all later again sometime. Thank you. All right, thanks again. Thank you.